A very good morning once again. Welcome to another live broadcast. My name is Isaiah Phillips Akintola. We want to bless God for another beautiful day. What a time we had yesterday evening uh, sharing on some principles that heaven is revealing to us regarding the restoration of the altar and of course the priesthood. It's important that we continue to listen and to hear what God, amen, is revealing to us regarding this new day. I want to believe God this morning once again to push further, amen, some of the things that we looked at yesterday, the certain things we kept hanging yesterday. But we believe God this morning, all right, in the next uh, uh, 40 minutes thereabout to see how we can push further. By the way, we are already done a, a, a live stream this morning on our YouTube, YouTube channel. You want to check on that later on. We believe in God to kind of change, all right, the time. You know, the time that we, you know, we uh, rather I'm trying to, you know, divide, you know, the time that we use online. I want to, you know, reach out to our audience on YouTube. And of course, we also really want to continue to do what we're doing on, on uh, Facebook. So most of our prayer right now, morning prayer will be done on YouTube, which is what I've been doing for a while now. So you want to check that later on. I will normally share the link on our uh, Facebook, but most time most people don't see it. But anyhow, this is the direction we are believing God, all right, to go at least until he speaks otherwise. So once again, join me this morning. Thank you for connecting wherever you're watching from this morning. We believe God, amen, that he will continue to lead us. I know uh, it's a bit late. Many people are already getting ready. All right, to go to work, that's fine. If you have the, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the data to be able to listen to me while you're driving, that's, that's good. But if you don't have, well, I'm sure you can always listen to this later on. So we want to thank God, all right, for what the Spirit of God is doing in our day. God is giving us grace and capacity to push further, to continually take his counsel, his desire, amen, to the place of his divine intention. And this is what we are seeking for. Thank you so much, Sister Diony, for joining this morning. And I see about two other people joining us. Thank you for joining. Uh, you want to also check our, you know, our YouTube channel later on, you know, for the prayer that we did this morning. Powerful prayer time we had this morning. Very short, but very precise, very articulate. We thank God for what the Spirit of God has continued to do in our day. All right. This morning, we're just going to quickly go into what, amen, the Lord has been emphasizing and, and, and leading us into. Of course, we've been dealing with the restoration of the altar, the restoration of the altar, and of course, the restoration of the priesthood, which will lead us to the restoration of the authority of God back into our life and into the body of Christ, the nation, all right? There is no way we can look at and try to understand all right, what is going on across the globe right now if we don't look at those things from the eyes of the spirit if <clears throat> excuse me if we're not connecting through the prophetic amen, eyes of the spirit and this is what i am particularly you know concerned about i want to see that amen we track we we precisely track amen where we are what god is doing i remember mentioning yesterday that if we don't amen clearly understand what brought us to where we are if we don't understand the nature the the the, the, the event that led us to where we are right now it will be very difficult for us to have a picture of where amen the lord is leading us into and this is why, amen, the teachings that we've been doing, amen, are in the context of God's prophetic objective. We're going somewhere. We began to look at this, you know, concept way back from the days of Noah. We began from Noah, all right, that something happened in the day of Noah, all right? The people refused to stand. The, pe the people refused to walk in the ways of God. They refused to, you know, to, to carry out, amen, the, 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 the desires of God. And God decided, okay, I was going to judge, he was going to judge the people and he did judge the people. But before he judged the people, we saw God saying, all right, Noah, I found, you know, you found favor before me. I want you to build an ark. And we saw that ark, amen, as a transport, amen, that gave redemption. We saw that ark, amen, as, 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 as a pattern, as a portal, amen, as, as, a, as a principle, amen, that we need, amen, to understand. Because it was that ark that kept Noah and his family. The Bible called them the eight. Eight is always the number of new beginnings. So God was going to re restart, kickstart. God was going to do something new again in the earth. Of course, the newness of God always begin, amen, in eight. Amen. The newness of God always begin in eight because when things reach that seventh order, perfection, the next dimension, amen, is eight, new beginning. 
And another dimension, amen, that we looked at, amen, is that God brought Noah into a new day, amen. He, he, he spoke to Noah, he said, you and your family come out of the ark. Come out of the ark. So after destruction, there was a there was a time frame where God had to allow the water to reset. And after, of course, after the water has reseted, the scripture says the Lord spoke to Noah again. All right. The word of the Lord came to Noah to come out of the ark. So we've been tracking, amen, for the past six months, there are about five months, you know, five, six months. We've been tracking what it means to come out of the ark. I'm, I'm repeating this so that we don't forget, amen, you know, what, what the spirit of God is, is doing in our day. Amen. We, are, we, are, we, are not, we, are, we have not yet come to the point, to the place where we can begin to say, yes, it's time to begin to walk. It's time to begin to do whatever we want to do. We are still looking at value values and principles in the word of God. Amen. These things must be well established in our heart. We must understand the nature of the day, the sacredness of the day, amen, must dawn on us. And I can understand, all right, when we get ourselves distracted and all kinds of things, you know, it's just humanly. That's the human nature, all right, to, to, to want to find his or security, to want to find, you know, fulfillment and, and you know, and God knows what, in what, whatever we can lay hold. Because we cannot do without, amen, having things, having, you know, all Holding on to whatever it is, you know, we you know how it is, you know. But God is saying, before you begin to run and and get yourself into things that I have not allowed you know, into your space, wait, listen to me, listen to what I'm saying, listen to you know what I am doing. I am restarting, kickstarting the earth again. All right, like they said in the book in the book of Peter, they said since the fathers fell asleep, all things have been the same. When we have that kind of mindset of just following the flow, you know, walking with the Joneses, not having a sense of clarity and understanding and insight, amen, and, and perspective to the days of God, to the move of God, to the desires of God. I mean, we are bound to face accident. And that's something we want to avoid. We cannot repeat the mistakes of the past. And of course, saying that means that we need to walk in awareness. Awareness will cause us to have a heart, amen, that is, that is, that is, that is open to God. And awareness will cause us to have a heart, amen, that is sincere, amen. Awareness will cause us to have a heart, amen, that is yearning, that is longing. We cannot decide, like we said yesterday or two days ago, we cannot decide things on our own strength. The Lord has brought our strength to ground zero. This day, amen, we will engage via the strength of God. This day we will engage via the wisdom of God. This day we will engage via the of understanding and the revelation, amen, that is unfolding before our very eyes. So whatever strength we represent, whatever authority we represent, whatever thing that we tend to be depending on or we are looking onto, we'll have to bow the knees. The Bible says, amen, all of all of the strength, amen, of the men of Israel came to an end. Nobody entered into, amen, the day of the promise without their strength coming to an end. So this day, God is reinventing, amen, his creation, if you will. God is rebuilding, rebranding his church. We're going to begin to see a new image of people. We're going to begin to see a new sense of people, a new a new order of people. And we, of course, we've tagged these people the new day priesthood. Because whatever God wants to do, he, he does them via his priesthood. And once a priesthood is compromised, God can no longer move. The moment the priesthood of Eli got compromised, God could no longer move. God began to look for another order, another, you know, vessel. And there was a priesthood, amen, even in the house of Eli that God was raising by the name, amen, Samuel. So we got to understand all of these principles and dynamics. The spirit of God, amen, is doing a new thing in our day. And that must be contextualized, amen, in the, in the prophetic objective of God. When we say God is doing a new thing, it's not just about giving us a new car. It's not just about giving us a new house. It's not just about giving us, you know, uh, you know, you know, a husband, a wife, a child, you know, a, a new job, a promotion. All of those things are good. But that is not what God is about. God is about, amen, the redemption of creation. God is about, amen, the manifestation of his 
kingdom. The Bible says the kingdoms of this world must become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. And a priesthood must align themselves, amen, to that prophetic order. This morning, you know, on face on, on YouTube, I was sharing, amen, on something very important. In Amos, you know, you know, 9 11, God said he will restore the fallen tent of, of, of David. He will restore, amen, the, 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 the destroyed tabernacle of David. He said, in that day, I will restore it. In fact, maybe I should quickly look into that. I've got it open here. He said in Amos, verse, uh, Amos chapter 9, verse 11, in that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. And I remember sharing this morning on YouTube that there was a priesthood in David. That not even Moses amen, was aware of. There was a priesthood in, the, in David. This priesthood, amen, if you look at the life of David, I mean, David was a priest. David was a, David was a, uh, you know, was a prophet. David was a king. All right? David was a warrior. David was a psalmist. I mean, it's like David represents the fivefold dimension. Amen. It's like David was the forerunner of Christ. I mean, and that was David. Because God found in David a heart. A heart. Amen. That is after him. And what and we begin to look at the nature of that heart. The Bible says David led the people of God with a heart of integrity and with a skillful hand he led them. So in David we find amen, some powerful spiritual principle that is speaking to us regarding the nature of the days that we live in. So that when we talk about the restoration, amen, of the fallen tent of, of, of David, when we talk about the restoration of the altar, we, we must understand that we're talking about a caliber of people, a quality of people we're talking about amen a people in the earth that truly ref represent and reflect amen what god wants to see manifest in the earth the very thing that the first man the first adam hallelujah missed and lost amen god is restoring through amen the second man the last adam the last adam is a priesthood <laughs> the last Adam is a priesthood and in this priesthood we find a man the government of God remember I said earlier on whenever God wants to move he moves through his priesthood God never exhibit his authority his glory his power hallelujah his dominion his resource in the earth without a priesthood the priesthood is very important to God let me quickly take you to uh, um, Hebrews chapter 7 I hope you're following me this morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you so much, my dear friend Dorothy. Thank you. It's nice to have you join us this morning. Thank you, women of God. Uh, uh, Nkumisa, thank you. But Derek, thank you, everyone, joining us. I think I also saw Sister uh, Tina. I'm not sure. But thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. This is going to be a quick one, hopefully, by God's grace. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. It says, Okay, let's not take it from verse 7 because if I take it from verse... Okay, let's take, let's take it from verse 1. Hebrews chapter Hebrews chapter 7, all right? We're dealing with the priesthood here, okay? We want to... You see, because when we talk about the restoration of the altar, a priest must, a priest must function in that, in that altar, all right? And all of the things that we're dealing with, though they may sound as types and shadows, but the, the substance, the fulfillment, amen, is in Christ Jesus. And if we are of Christ, if Christ is in us, if our life has become one with Christ, then we've got to understand, amen, that all of the things that God wants to see manifest through his son, through the priesthood of Jesus, through the ascended priesthood of Jesus, amen, must become manifest. When we say, may the kingdom of God come, when we say, as it is in heaven, so, amen, so must it be done on earth. We are talking about a pattern of a life, amen, that reflect what is heavenly, amen, in the earth. Because the desire of God is to make all things one. The desire of God is to restore earth back to heaven. The desire of God, amen, is to have that same rapport that he used to have in the garden, amen, in the beginning. When the Bible says God will come down at the cool of the day, that cool of the day, amen, is like a, it's like, it's like a twinkle of an eye. It's like a slip of a finger like this. God is there. It's not like he had to travel down. He traveled down to, no, no. It's just like this. Just, the Bible says, and we shall be changed, amen, in the twinkle of an eye. It's a dimension of a life where we can switch between, amen, the natural realm and the spiritual realm. It's a dimension, amen, of a life, amen, of immortality that we're coming into. That when we begin to understand the priesthood that heaven wants us to walk in in this last day, we will no longer be limited, not by time, amen, not by circumstance, not by people, not by situation. We will no longer be limited because we have stepped into the full reality of 
the man child. We have stepped into the full reality, amen, of the heavenly priesthood, amen. Our life has become one with the Father, amen. The Bible says, he who has become one with the, of the Lord is of, 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 of one spirit with Christ. Come on. Heaven is bringing us into that order. So we've got to understand that this priesthood we're, we're talking about is not just some, you know, denominational, functional priesthood. We're talking about the power of eternal life. We're talking about the priesthood, amen, that will reflect, amen, eternity, that will manifest, amen, the kingdom of God to the sons of men. We're talking about the priesthood that can walk, amen, that can speak, amen, that can represent all of the desires of God in the earth. And in this priesthood, we find it in Melchizedek. You will notice that in the priesthood of Melchizedek, the Bible never really spoke about the altar of Melchizedek. Every priest must have an altar. The altar of Melchizedek is a position of oneness. It's a condition of oneness that Melchizedek, amen, has come, has come into with God. Because the altar of Melchizedek is the heart. It's the heart of Melchizedek. It's not some priesthood that is built, amen. The hell of the things that we are reading. You see, all the typologies that we are seeing in the old covenant must become a spiritual state. State, must become a spiritual life must become a spiritual condition in our in our in our existence such that amen there are no boundaries and we saw that priesthood in in in, in somebody like uh, 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 nehemiah the bible says amen while the king was asking nehemiah so what do you want me to do regarding this you know issue that you're talking about the bible says and nehemiah prayed and he was standing before the king he was he was he was speaking to the king but the bible says he was praying so how how does a man a man shift from the natural to the spiritual because the natural has become spiritual to the man the spiritual has become natural to <laughs> when the spiritual becomes natural and the natural becomes spiritual to us we have come into the day of the melchizedek order where our life becomes the expression of the mind of god of the thought of god of the heart of god of the desires of god you know as i'm saying this thing it gets me scared <laughs> It gets you scared. When you begin to think of what God wants to see manifest in the earth. You know, a few days ago, me and my children, we began to talk about the concept of, you know, teleporting. I mean, the Bible talks about Philip, Philip, Philip. He, 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 just, he just baptized the Ethiopian Enoch and suddenly this guy was gone. He was disappeared. He just teleported from one dimension to the next. All of these things that, you know, the world system are trying to tell us, you know, they are trying to create, you know, technology to teleport, to move from one place. These things have been locked in the word of God is there. But we cannot touch this thing, amen, with the kind of priesthood, with the priesthood that has been compromised. God, I mean, how did Elijah outrun the chariot? That is not just a story. That's a reality. That is not a figment of human imagination. That is not a myth. That's not some Bible story. That is a reality. The Bible says the spirit of the Lord came upon Elijah. How did David, a natural young boy, amen, is still a lad. How did he fought a lion, tore the, tore the lion, took, hallelujah, the ship of his father from the mouth? from the jawbones of the lion hallelujah how did he kill the bear i'm talking about a day where we are going to step into a dimension of a priesthood that no power in hell will be able to stop us they can't even refuse you because all of your life has become one with god you say it it comes to pass and in that day you shall ask of me anything and it shall be done by my father. I told you that is not just ab ab about praying. It's just, that's not a request. That is a point where your life has become one. You have become an extension of heaven. Your life has become the expression, the, ex the, the, the very enfoldance of just like Christ, amen, represented his father on earth. Your life becomes a reflection of the father on earth. You have become one with Christ. You've gone beyond just, you know, you know, a make-believe gospel. You've gone beyond just, you know, a, an idealistic gospel. You have allowed yourself, amen, to be plunged into the process, into the training. Like I was sharing with one of my sisters. All right? You, you, you've come into a day where your life, you, you choose to be processed. They say stay in that house, stay in that relationship, stay in that situation, hallelujah. You, but that thing is killing you. They say yes, it's for something to, to be born out of you. It's for something to come out of you. The reason why we kept you in that tightness, the reason why we kept you in that situation is because we want to bring something out of you. 
We want to bring something out of your life. But if you run from that thing, you never become what God has ordained for you. It's, it's the order of the priesthood. That's the process, amen. When you, when you finally, finally finish that process, you come out. You come out blazing. You become the reflection of God. Nobody touches this dimension by just a wish, by just hallelujah, praise God. God knows. No, no. You've got to plunge yourself. Have you noticed that the Lord did not, did not, did not choose to save you know, Daniel and his brother before the fire. He allowed them to be thrown in the fire because they have been prepared for such a time. Why? Because, you see, the mother persecution, the mother glory. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? I'm trying to bring you to an understand, to understand what the Spirit of God, amen, is doing in our day. Because if we don't understand where we're coming from, we don't know where we're going. We will just settle for what people call church. We will settle for what people call Christianity. We will settle for praise God, hallelujah. The Lord is good, amen. No, there is an objective. There is something God wants to see birth through this church. In every generation, there is a reason why God, hallelujah, establishes a priesthood. There's a reason why God establishes amen, a priesthood. In every marriage, there is a priesthood. And that priesthood must raise priests unto God. In every business, there is a priesthood. And that priesthood must raise amen, other priests amen, in the marketplace. Sayando. Come on. In the government, there is a priest that must be established so that amen, the glory and the power of God can become manifest. We are all ex established a representative of the priesthood of God wherever heaven has positioned us. This is how we take the city. This is how we take the land. But if we don't understand that we have been ordained for such a time as this, and all we see is the pain, and all we see, amen, is the contradiction, and all we see is the resistance of the enemy, and all we see, amen, is wanting to run away. Listen to this. God's will cannot be established. I told us yesterday we're going to look at that scripture again. All right, in, 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 in Ezra, it was in Ezra chapter 3, when they began to build, amen, the altar, when they began to restore the foundation of the altar, guess what? There was resistance, but despite the resistance, Joshua and the rest, hallelujah, built the altar, built the, built the foundation of the altar, because the altar is the place of the establishment of the government of God, <laughs> The altar is the place of the establishment of the government of God. Many of the things that we have learned in time past about the concept of the tabernacle, we will have to go back to school and learn them again because, amen, revelation is progressive. Revelation is progressive. The revelation you had about the tabernacle of Moses, amen, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, cannot suffice, cannot carry the, the reality of what God is doing because everything that God is doing in this day, amen, is locked, hallelujah, in that tabernacle. Everything that God is birthing in our day is accomplished. That, that tabernacle of Moses, amen, you know, it, it is coded with dimensions of life that we have to come into. We have to realize because that was a shadow, but the substance has come, which is Christ. And the more we talk about the sonship ministry, the more we talk about, amen, the ministry of Christ, the more we've got to talk about and understand the priesthood. There is no sonship without a priesthood. What makes, amen, a son, a son before the father is because he's first a priest. <laughs> This day I have begotten you. Those whom God has begot are begotten via the priesthood. It is the priesthood that allows us to understand who we are, what we represent. If you run a ministry and your ministry is not aligning to the divine order of the priesthood of the Son of God, you will not be able to maximize the authority, the power, hallelujah, and the government of God regarding your calling, regarding your ministry, regarding your family, regarding your marriage, regarding your business. That's why I keep saying before we step into anything in this new day we need to rediscover the divine order the divine pre, you know principle we need to rediscover the divine organogram so that we can function we can flow hallelujah based on that which the spirit of god is doing in every generation in every season there is a order of a priesthood that heaven wants to see manifest that must function the priesthood must go ahead that's why when they, restore, when they got back to the land and they went back building their house, God said, you got it wrong. You got it wrong. <laughs> You've got to first of all rebuild, amen, the temple. You've got to first of all rebuild, amen, the altar. If you, if you, if you start running after your business, and what does that mean? It means the priority of your life should not be you first. 
The priority of your life, because somebody said, but how do I do that? The priority of your life should not be you first. Should not be your son. Should not be your daughter. Should be the house of God. And what is the house of God? Of course, you are the house of God. But the house of God <clears throat> represents, amen, the, 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 the values, the intentions of God. <laughs> what God wants to see manifest through your life. Because when you go to the house of God, what do you get? You get clarity. You get understanding. When you go to the house of God, you get insight. You, you get to know the mind of God. You get to know the ways of God. All right. And for you to know that something has to be restored. There has to be a connection to the altar. All right. The altar is not just a place where you dump money. <clears throat> Oh, come on, Lord, let me speak this morning. <clears throat> the altar is not just a place where we go, you know, you say, the man of God is preaching and we start dumping money. That is inviting another spirit into the house. Let me say it because we are in a new day. All of, we, all of those people, the man of God is praying, they start dumping money. Listen to this. You are inviting another spirit into the house. We need to cleanse the house. When we cleanse the house, we can build according to divine pattern. In fact, when they refuse to clean the house, when they refuse to do what God wants them to do, God send them, amen, on a sabbatical leave. 70 years in Babylon. Now they return. Instead of them to go back and do what heaven, amen, has ordained the same, the very reason why they were free. The Bible said they went back rebuilding their house. God said, you did not, you did not learn. You, you still did not learn. If you don't do what I will ask, ask you to do, I will put holes in your pocket. You are going to work. You will make money. You will earn salary. But guess what? You wouldn't know what you spend the money for. You will sow, but you're going to reap very little. Why? Because they said they have neglected my house. And I'm telling you that while the house of God is corporate, while the house of God is a place where we gather, while the house of God, of God is a place where we meet and worship and do all of those things and pray and all of the, the house of God starts with us. The house of God starts with me. When your when your life aligns to God's desire, to God's pattern, to God's intention, God begins to restore your house. Hallelujah! And you become a man, an extension of the restoration of the house of God to other people. Listen to this. When we begin to place material things ahead of the restoration of the house of God, we will not be able to come into. You see, what I'm saying is not for everybody to listen to. We're not here to preach to everybody. We're here to bring earlier the order of God back. All of those nonsense people are doing. Dumping money on the altar. I think, oh, we're serving God. All those things must come to an end. Or else God will judge the house again. Say it. Isaiah Philip said it. If we don't stop this nonsense of dumping money on the altar. Amen. That is a sacred place. If you want to give an offering, go put it somewhere else. Don't create a distraction in the house of God. Because if we do that, the judgment will fall on the church again. We've been talking about this for the past 20 years. When we invite the spirit of Mammon to replace the spirit of God, we have brought Dagon, we have brought Baal into the house. And God judged the people because, you see, Baal is the God of economy. Baal is the God of economy. This is the reason why God seized the rain for three and a half years. Because the people decide to follow Baal. Who brought Baal into the house? Jezebel. Who allowed Jezebel into the house? The priest! Did Isaiah say don't give money? I never said so. Did Isaiah say we shouldn't bless the people of God? I never said so. I said the pattern we do it, the way we do it has to change because the priesthood has changed. This is a priesthood of the heart, not a priesthood of the hand. This is a priesthood of the heart, not a priesthood of material things. If we want to see God move, if you, have, if you ever have a passion, a longing, a desire for your, for your nation, if you ever want to see God to move in your land, every man must go back to their house and look at how amen, they have built. Because when we have refused to build in accordance to the divine order, in accordance to the divine pattern, somebody say, what is wrong in giving money, in dumping money on the altar? Well, you think something is not wrong about it, but think about this. What about the people that can not give that what about the people that have been soulishly motivated to do what others are doing the bible says if what you're gonna eat will cause your brother to fall for your brother's sake don't do it all things are lawful but not things not all things are expedient now we have to move into the expediency of the things of god yes we are going beyond what is good. We are going to what the scripture call a more excellent. He said, Behold, I show you a more excellent. 
excellent way. If we're going to go on with God, if we're going to enter into the day of the Lord, if we're going to become a priest that can enter the holies of holy without dying, because people are going to be falling dead in this last day. God has given us this opportunity to see what the corona can do. God has allowed us to, to see his wrath and to see his redemption, to see his mercy. If we continue, if we go back continuing doing the same old thing, then we're seeking for his wrath. We're looking for his judgment. When the kings of the earth said, we're not going to listen, we're not going to bow. Are you seeing what God is doing? I told us some time ago, when Boris Johnson caught the virus, I say it was a way of God, amen, speaking to United Kingdom. God was, God was humbling the, the nation. We thought that was enough. God decided, okay, I'm going to also allow, amen, I'm going to allow Donald Trump to also taste it. You talk about God speaking in this last day. You talk about God moving in this last day. He will humble the nation. Remember, judgment begins in the house of God. Amen. Before judgment gets into the White House or to somewhere, judgment begins in the house of God. So we have to align our life. We are the instrument of the voice of God to the nation. So we have to see all of the things happening around us are patterns. They are images speaking to us Amen. of the day of the Lord. It will go down in history. That the president of the United States of America also caught the virus. He was shut down. Not only did they shut down the nation, they shut down the man. Whose life defines power, authority, strength. When they asked him, I was listening to an interview they did. Was it two, two days ago? They said, so how did you feel the first day you, you, know, you were taken to, you know, to the hospital? He said, I felt weak. <laughs> he could not lie. He said, I, f he said, I just felt weak. He said, even though I, mean, I wasn't suffering from the lack of breath, he said, but I felt weak. Look at what that coronavirus did. It takes the breath of people. It paralyzes them, makes them feel weak. They, they, people have to be put on oxygen. A few days ago, it's like the Lord was speaking to me on that. Did you see, the, the, did you see how this thing attacks? It takes your life. It takes your breath. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is a giver of life. is a giver of breath. Why is this thing attacking the breath of people? Right? Because amen, what we use our breath for is contrary to what God designed it for. This is something that is very important. Okay, I'm just deviating right now. But I think it's something we've got to think about. So there is nothing that happens in the natural and human realm that is just accidental. Everything amen, speaks of the eternality, of the counsels of God, of the program of God, of the desires of God, even when we think it's just natural. When we just think, oh, well, President Trump just had, you know, he just had also contacted the coronavirus and that was it. No, no, no. It's not just God is saying something to us. He said, in that day, God will humble. He said, I will humble, amen, the loftiness of the nations. I will, I will bring it down. This, uh, these are days where we need to what, humble ourselves so that we don't get humiliated. One of the nature of the priest, amen, is, is the cloak of humility. He must wear the cloak of humility. You see, the, the, the priest, before he wears those shiny regalia, all those, you know, colorful regalia, the first thing he wears on the inside is that leaning effort. That leaning effort. And the priest must not sweat. In other words, it's not by might. It's not going to be by power. Our strength Everything that defines our strength must be laid on the altar, totally. Must be laid on the altar. Everything that defines your strength, your power, your ability, amen, whatever it is, must be laid on the altar. We are tracking God's voice, God's mind, God's heart, God's desire for this brand new day. Listen, when you are doing all of that, you will sound weak, you will look weak, you will feel weak. People will call you weak, amen. But in then the Bible says in your weakness, his strength is what? perfected. God's strength is not perfected in our strength. God's strength is not perfected in our strength. God's strength is perfected in our weakness. When you're weak, he said, then you are strong. You see, strength is when you think I'm in charge. 
Strength is when you think I'm in control. I know what to do. I know what to say. I mean, the people who went ahead of us, who taught us this, this journey, Jesus said, go. I will put my words in your mouth in that day. You will not need to worry about what, I mean, to the point that you have to wait on the Lord regarding what you say. That is how committed God, amen, is calling us. He said, I will put my words in your mouth. No wonder they, were, they, they, they could not resist them. Though they were unlearned, but no one could resist them. I said, though they were unlearning, but they had been with Jesus. Today, we, we don't want to be with Jesus again. We want to go to Harvard. We want to go and collect, amen, all the degrees. That's where today, men of God, you hear them, they call them doctor, professor. Now they, 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 now they don't want to be called bishops and act bishops again. Now they want to be called doctor. You know, they invite, they, they're introducing the man of God. You know, here's doctor, God knows what. I said, that's an experience. Expression is just an expression of their insecurity because they, 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 they think that by leveraging with the standard of the world, they think that by leveraging with the standard of the world, amen, that they will be accepted. Listen to this. It is strength. And by strength shall no man prevail. If your strength is not in the Lord, your wisdom will be as stubble, will be as rubbish before the Lord. It was David, excuse me, it was Paul who said, amen, all that I have gained that's a man who gained a man four doctorate degree four some people say five amen he said all of the things that i've gained i can't i call i i call them dung i count them dung that i may gain christ that i may gain christ i that i may know him that i may know him i want to be conformed to the suffering of my lord jesus christ listen friends there are things we've got to am i saying people should not study i never said so by the way, most of those good people who call themselves doctors, they never study for a, a doctorate degree. It's just an honor, honorary doctorate. Somebody give, some, they give money somewhere, somebody give them you know, a, a, a doctorate degree. And they're going around calling themselves doctor, bishop, all of this. Listen to this. In this last day, they will be humiliated because they will not be able, hallelujah, to bring answer to the issues of the day. They will not have the authority and the power. Even when they have studied, listen to this, God will make sure that their power becomes as nothing they will be humiliated before the nations of the world what is god saying humble yourself under the mighty hand of god that you may be exalted in due season when we do things to project ourselves we will be humiliated when we do things Amen. For self-honor and self-glory we will be brought down. The loftiness of men and their high look shall be brought down. He said, for these, these horns are the horn that stood against Judah and Jerusalem. That no man lift his head. Yes, when you, when you refuse to bow the knees before Christ, God will raise the horns of the Gentiles to bring you down. For by strength shall no man prevail. We're tracking a priesthood. Priest to reflect, manifest humility. A priest that is pompous, that is full of himself or herself, that is full of, full of pride. That all you want to see is you. When you are in the house, you fool the house. You, 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 know, you, you, you become large and mighty. You, know, you, 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 you become larger than life. As a priest, God will humble you. Because it takes humility to access the things of God. You cannot be spiritual. If your life, amen, if your character, if your attitude is not one that has bent the knees. Remember that scripture I read. Philippians, uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Paul said, before the God whom, let me see if I can track that scripture quickly. Thank you, Father. Yes, Philippians, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. You know, we have priests today that cannot kneel. And I hope you understand that kneeling is the condition of the heart. is a posture of life. is a state, amen, of bowing before the Lord. There are priests who physically kneel down, but before the Lord they are standing tall. They, 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 they have taken... The place of God in the hearts of men. 
to kneel, amen, is to show the people the way into God. I kneel before the Father. From whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named. Can you imagine? If, 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 if we see ourselves from this order of a priesthood that we are family. Would I want to take advantage of you? Would I want to rip you? Would I want to lie to you and, you know, an ungodly, un, un, an express ungodly nature and character and, and, and take all of your resources in the name of, well, I'm the man of God. Come on, let me speak this morning. I'm the man of God. You got to understand, man of God, that office heaven has given to you is a sacred one. And it's given to you based, amen, on the honor of God. Because he found you worthy to receive it. So when you abuse that authority, that position, you will be stripped. Go ask Saul. Ask Eli. There are several we can ask. We can look at their life. It's a day of sight. It's a day where we need to turn our heart back to God. We are dealing with the restoration of the altar and the priesthood. So that once again the authority of God can be restored to the church. Because the church will never become anything amen, without, without, without government, without authority. The church was designed to be the expression of the government of God on earth. But you will agree with me today. That's no longer the issue. We have been stripped of our authority. Today we are, we are pushing left, right, and center. We are hit here and there. We don't know if we're coming, if we're going. I mean, the war power, God government can shut us down. They can tell us, sit down there, we sit down there. Because now all we want to do, amen, is to be in their good book. The authority of God is no longer flowing from Zion. Because Zion is left in ruin. But God says, I will restore in that day. I'm restoring the ruined place of Zion. The ruin place of Zion will begin from the restoration of the priesthood of David. When, David. when David gets to be restored, I hope you understand that David is a pattern. David is alive. There is a system. The Davidic order is being restored in our day because that Davidic order is what will connect us to the Melchizedek order. I told us we're coming to a day where the condition of our heart will allow us to become a people that can speak, that can represent the things of God. The things of God must be represented, amen, in a state of honor, in a state, hallelujah, of integrity, with a heart, hallelujah, of purity. The pure in heart will see God. I said I was going to read uh, um, Hebrews chapter 7. Of course, the book of Hebrews tells us the different dimensions and pattern of where we are, where, where God brought us out from and where he's leading us to. In, 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 uh, uh, in Hebrews 7, because of time, maybe I should just go straight down to verse uh, 11, which I want to read. But okay, it's fine. Let me start from verse 1. This Melchizedek was a king of Salem, a priest of God of the Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the four kings and blessed him. This Melchizedek met Abraham returning from the defeat of the four kings. Remember the four kings that invaded Sodom and Gomorrah? And because Lot, amen, was in Sodom and Gomorrah, they had to send for, you know, for Abraham, come, come rescue your brother. He's been captured. That's what happened when you live before your time. When you leave the house, when you leave your Abraham before your time, you move into a place where you have no sight, amen, to see, amen. Before you know it, you become a captive. Verse, verse 2, and Abraham gave, Abraham gave him, who's him? He gave Melchizedek. This is some powerful principle that we're seeing here. Have you noticed that it's not Melchizedek that asks for tight? <laughs> Come on, let's, let's read on. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. That's why I keep telling people, Tight is a personal revelation. Nobody forces you to do it. You decide in your heart because, amen, of your ability to acknowledge grace, to acknowledge, amen, the blessings of God, the favor of God, amen, in the life of an elder. Tight is paid, amen, to one, amen, that is above us. To one that is an elder that represents the heart of God, the mind of God. 
personally to you, to you, to you. The one who opened your eyes to see things. The one who gave you insight. Who, who showed you things. Who brought you out, amen, of, of, of certain dimension that you, you've been struggling to get out of. You could not get out of it. But somebody came and just opened the door. He becomes an elder in your life. He speaks into your life. He gives insight. He gives, he gives clarity to you. you when, whenever this person speaks to you, you have a sense of peace. You have a sense of God. He feeds you. He strengthens you. Such a person you pay your thighs to. If the Spirit of the Lord has ministered to you. That is why the concept of the restoring of the priest is important. Who are the true priests? They pay your tithe to the wrong priest. They skin you, milk you, and still put you in a state, amen, where you'll be wondering, am I coming or am I going? You're in prison. Because the moment you start paying that tithe, and they say, well, this person's got money, all right? They build, they build, amen, you know, a, a, a bar around your life. You can no longer escape. Many people today have become imprisoned in the house of God, in the so-called house of God. They keep them down. They give them title. They give them deacon. They give them eldership because, you know, they know that they are rich. They know that, all right, uh, this one can help us to do what. Listen, if you have to be running the work of God, amen, based on your own wisdom, based on your own resource, then you don't know what God is doing. You don't know. And there are certain men of God, just because they cannot wait on the Lord to supply their needs through the people that God has given to them, they go into the marketplace and start working. So every month, all right, they've got 20,000 to put to the work of God. All right, they are the one that will pay for the drum. They are the one that will play for the, you know, the guitarist. They are the one that will play for the keyboardist. They use their own money. You're not running the house of God. You're not running God's work. God does not want your money to run his house. I'm not saying don't bless the work of God, but God does not design and intend his house to be run, amen, by the money that the man of God makes. No, 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 no. Because the house does not belong to you. You can't run the house of God like a personal, you know, personal property, personal business. Come on. I'm alive this morning. Let me speak, Lord. You got to correct all this nonsense, the two extremes. And some people, when they start paying their fight to the man of God, they start manipulating the man of God. They, they think now the man of God must be at their beck and call. Sorry! It doesn't work like that. When you pay your fight to the man, you're paying it to the God that the man represents. So don't control him. Don't manipulate him. Don't try to intimidate him. Now, if you don't do what we want you to do, we will not, we will not, we will not, we will, we will not, we will not submit. We will not, we will not pay the tithe again. Uh, so the work of God will suffer. You better go. You better hold your money and watch God bless his work. We're going to balance it. The man of God takes advantage of the people. The people also take advantage of the man of God. They say, it's our money that he's using. It's not your money. Who gave you the money? If it's your money, then the life God gives to you, he takes it from you. How much can you pay for the breath God has given to you? How much can you pay for the revelation, for the impartation, for the grace, for the prayer, for the supplication that the man of God makes on your behalf? How much can you pay for that? So don't think this is just a one-way thing. It's a, it's a both-way thing. Everybody in the house of God, everybody is taking advantage of each other. <laughs> That's why somebody like Isaiah must be there. We've got to have an elder. An, an elder in the house that can umpire. Hallelujah. That can bring things into order. That's why somebody like me, it's difficult for me to start a church. We, we will start a church. Maybe somebody else will run it, but it's not me. I'm not going to run a church. Because if I do, then I will, I, will, I will be abusing the grace and the gift that God has given to me. Because my grace and my gift is to see that we, we bring back the church of Christ, amen, to the place of divine functionality. So it takes people who have sight to be a blessing to me. Because it's not about your church. It's about the restoration, hallelujah, of the order of God. It's about the restoration of the grace of God. Listen, please share this link as I'm speaking right now. Share this link to your friends. Let them know God is speaking. We want freedom in the house of God. 
the house that will close, let it close. Then we know that God is not there. If everybody leave because they don't want to pay their tithe again, if the house close, it means God never sent you. God has delivered you, man of God. He set you free. <laughs> Hallelujah. He has set you free. And for those who are paying their tithe earlier, and you know you're paying it to the wrong place because you don't feel peace, you don't feel joy, you don't feel that you're supposed to be there. Why are you paying it? Leave the place and go look for a place that heaven has ordained for you. Listen to this. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. You can outgrow a church. <laughs> oh, well, somebody said, what's going on this morning? God is speaking. I've said this before. You can outgrow a place. And because the man of God, he feels, oh, this person is going to leave. So he starts doing all kinds of things. He starts bringing all kinds of ministers, you know, to come and preach. You know, because he knows that he cannot preach the word. Listen to this. If it's time for you to leave, when you, you know you have peace to leave, leave. The day comes when God says, okay, stop following Isaiah. Please leave. Because I have nothing to offer to you. But if you know that amen, it's not time for you to leave and you decide to leave because you're angry with Isaiah, listen to this. You'll be out there in the cold. We need to balance the word of the Lord. No, we don't force people come and go. No, no, no. We continue to proclaim and declare God is our provider and he will use people. People who God has worked in their heart and in their life. Even when they are being rebuked, they will still be given this. Ah, I love the way this man corrects me. I love the way this man rebukes me. He tells me the truth. He never lies to me. There are men of God lying to the people because they are the highest tithe payer in their church. When those people tell them, no, man of God, we don't want that. Those are sons of Eli. <laughs> sons of Eli. They shut off the voice of their father. They are the one they will take the fork and go pick the meat and pick the fattest one. They eat it. The, man, the, the, the father has no voice to tell them, don't do that again. It's a mess in the house of God. And this is not just about church thing. It's a dimension of life. You're a father, you cannot correct your child. You're afraid to correct your child. You're a mother, you cannot bring correction to your child. Just because you're afraid of your daughter or your son. Because of what they're going to say or how they're going to... Listen to this. You have lost your priesthood. You don't get to be manipulated by people's position, people's resource, how they look, what they do, where they come from. No. That's why God places elders in the house to bring order, to bring structure. <laughs> One scripture just takes us to another dimension. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Everything. The name Melchizedek means, why did they begin with a name? Because name reflects a nature. Name reflects a character. Name reflects a personality. Name defines who we are. These are days where people bear a name. You bear a name that does not define who you are. Listen to this. You will be, you will be, you will be, you will be targeted by the paths of darkness. Because every time they call your name, they summon a spirit. Every time your name is summoned, every time your name is called, there is a summoning, hallelujah, of your true identity. That's why you've got to understand, you know, people live in all kinds of dimensions of life that they are being lied to, they are being deceived because, amen, they don't understand why they do what they do. Some people give their children all kinds of name because, amen, they, they, they like the name, it sounds well. Some people today want to give their children, you know, three letter, three, 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 you know, uh, three, you know, uh, a letter word, you know, okay, is, 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 is bala, what's bala? <laughs> Before you know, you start giving your, your son, Balaam, you know, all kinds of crazy things people are doing today in the name of trying to be trendy. What is in your name? When the Lord finally, amen, brought our Lord Jesus Christ to the place of honor, the Bible says he gave him a name that is above every other name. There is something about the name that defines, that calls forth all that you represent. You, when they call your name, they summon your entire prophetic counsel. There are certain people when you call their name, the paths of darkness, they go into confusion. They go into oblivion. Why? Because that name represents something that the paths of darkness cannot, cannot withhold. And I hope you understand that it's not just about the name you bear. It's about the spirit spirit behind the name for all i care you can be bearing scriptural name but you, the name alia, is not reflecting the spirit alia, behind that name you also create alia, problem for yourself imagine alia, you call yourself isaiah but you're not reflecting the spirit 
What, 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 what produces the nature, the life of Isaiah is not manifested in your life. It allows the enemy to attack you. Blind people will do blind things. If the blind leads the blind, the Bible says the boat will fall into a ditch. Why am I saying this? The Bible says the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Hi. Hey. King of righteousness. So when you say Melchizedek, <laughs> you summon all the resources of righteousness into being. King of righteousness. Then also, you think that was enough? The, the Bible says, then also, you, you think king of righteousness was just enough? Then also, the scripture says, then also, King of Salem. <laughs> King of Salem. Shalom. King of Shalom. Salem. Shalom. The peace of God. The rest of God. The Sabbath of God. In Melchizedek we track all this. You can track Melchizedek by just studying the meaning of his name. Because your name is a reflection of your nature. Your character. Who you are. This is the reason why God changes the name of his prophets. The name of those amen, he wants to use to, birth, to bear, to birth, to reflect a divine intention. He changes their name. I told you, I did not just change my own name. I changed my son's name. And of course, that was done by the Spirit. <laughs> don't go do it. Don't, don't do it. The Lord has not asked you to do it. Or else you just put yourself in some big mess. Yeah. You got to come to certain dimension in your work with God. And I discover the entire generation of, of my own son name will not allow me to fully enter into the things that God has, you know, ordained for my life. Because the name was, I told you, that name was offered, has been dedicated to the goddess of the water. I said, no, I'm not going to bear this. I told my father. Before my father passed away, I said, daddy, I want to change my son name. In the Yoruba culture, you dare, that is like a curse. You dare not say you want to even change your own name. Not to talk of you know what well, you know what that means. It means all of the wisdom that defines those people who gave me the surname and the name. I brought them to shame, and that's what I did, because I discover they no longer have a hold over me. They no longer define who I am. They no longer tell me where my life, amen, is gonna end. No, my life is. You see, I came to understand my salvation as the most important thing in my life. And I said, if name is so important to God, and I know this name amen, is not aligning to God, to the will of God, excuse me, so why should I be bearing the name? To please my family? Whose family? I said, Daddy, I want to change my son's name. I want to bear your, your father's name. Not the compound name everybody's bearing. My daddy said, go ahead. It's like the man knew. You know, there are certain principality you cannot fight in your family. Asian devils that we are still carrying them around while we say we are Christians. No wonder those spirits can, can, you know, can jump from one generation to another because nobody woke, wakes up in a generation and says, no, it ends with me. You know, the fear was, if I have children and I don't have you know, a son, who is going to carry the name that I bear? Because that's the, that's the fear in most culture. Because that should be, you know, that should be the firstborn. That should be a male child carrying all right, the, you know, the family name. I said, the Lord, who has led me into all of this? Will give me. And I was determined, even if I have a daughter, so shall it be. If my name, if the name I'm bearing is going to end with me, with me, me, then this, I'm okay. You think I'm afraid to die? You think when I die today, you think I'm afraid that, oh, who's going to take me to Nigeria? If I die in South Africa, I'm buried here in South Africa. That's it. Wherever I die, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Who is connected to some ungodly tradition? I'm not connected. God delivered me. He set me free from all of that. That's why my life is like a rebel to some people. Yeah, that's a prophet. 
Go look at the life of prophets. You see, it's not, a, it's not by just bearing out oh, he's a prophet. No, there are things that you do that will shake family, communities to the root. It will shake them. You become a voice. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of death. And I'm not afraid of where I'm going to die. If, if what will lead me to go back to Nigeria, and of course I want to go back to Nigeria, is because first of all, I want to see my families. I want to enjoy the good food. I want to meet my friend. I'm continue back in South Africa doing what I want to do. It's not because I want, no, 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 no. I'm not attached to any place. I'm attached to where God is. If God sent me to Pakistan today, I am attached to that nation. Because, listen, where he sent us is where he is. A lot of Christians, they cannot go with the Lord. You know what? They are too attached to earthly things. When they change your name, they change your identity. They change your location. They change, amen, who you are, what you represent. If any man be in Christ, we still don't understand fully what that means. You will live under the shadow of some family and they will kill you. You think, oh, it's my family. <laughs> we'll talk about that some other day. <laughs> Jesus said, who is my mother? Who is my mother? Is he saying we should dishonor our mother, our parent? No. He said, there's something you don't understand. The Bible talks about our mother that is coming from above. <laughs> you see, when you start reading the scripture, your identity changes. Your perspective changes. Who you are changes. We're talking about the name Melchizedek. There's more to the name than just a name. His name, hallelujah, carries the secret of his priesthood. There was a priesthood in David, I told you. There was a priesthood in David. Not even, <laughs> not even, you know, uh, Moses and the rest of the people understood that priesthood. But there was a priesthood in David. And yet the Lord never said anything to us about the priestly ministry. But when you begin to track the scripture, you, you say, David was a priest. This guy is dangerous. No wonder he was able to kill Goliath. <laughs> Except only priests can kill Goliath. Only priests can shoot such a, a sling that you know the velocity the speed of this of the stone enter into goliath's forehead that's that's not might may your might come to an end so that his might can rise from within you i said may your might come to an end so that the day of the lord can can come upon you the grace of god can begin to flow through your life are you afraid? Are you bothered by the things that I've said? This is the word of the Lord. May God continue to lift the standard, the bar of his word in our life. This is the day of the daba of God. We're not just looking for Rema. We've gone, the, we've gone past Logos. This is the day of the Daba, the Daba of God. We're speaking the heart of God. We're bringing forth the intentions of God. We're giving voice to the thought of God. We're giving voice to the thought of God. This Melchizedek. Have you ever asked yourself, this man Melchizedek, who are the people that he ministered to? <laughs> what was the order of his priestly service? This is a priesthood that has no limit or boundary. That is not limited to a geographical location. Even though the Bible called him, amen, the king of righteousness, the king of Salem. Did he rule Jerusalem? He did, but not physically. He was a prince. Ah. Jesus. He was a prince over the realm. His priesthood amen, was in the dimension of the atmospheric order of Jerusalem. 
His priesthood was not of the earth. Even though he's connected to the earth, his priesthood was that, amen, of the realm. His priesthood was in charge over the realm of Jerusalem. Listen to this. Every nation has got a realm over their life. South Africa has got a realm. The Lord opened my eyes to see the realm, the principality over the realm of this nation. I've shared on that some time ago. There are all kinds of forces, powers. That's why if you want to understand all of these things, people are struggling to understand what's going on in the news. If you want to deal with the issues that you see taking place, warring over, you know, uh, over the soul of you know, the nation, all of the things going on regarding the ANC and the, all of this issue, if you want to understand, you've got to be in the spirit. You've got to understand the realm. You've got to understand the forces. You've got to understand the past, the, the puppeteers that are in charge, in control of the puppets we call leaders. In the ANC and all of these places, if you want to deal with, you see, if you want to deal with things, if you want to deal with people, you don't deal with them. The Bible says our wrestling match is not with flesh and blood. You don't start going fighting the ANC and say, oh, this crazy. No, no. You've got to take the battle into the realm of the spirit because each of them have got a prince that defines the control, that influences what they do. That's why we've got to understand the nature of God over cities, over nations. We've got to understand the intentions of God. We've got to understand the program of God. You see, I am not about trying to look for, you know, some political. No, 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 no. You see, I'm not even affiliated to any church. No, no, no. Because I understand that the power that defines how even a church is governed in a society, amen, is, is either defined by the governing spiritual authority, by the apostolicity, by the apostolic authority over that city, or by the prince of the past of air that rules over that city. You see, a church, that's why you see, every church, people when they start a church, when you go and decide, oh, let's start a church. <laughs> you start a church because you need to start a church because you're hungry, because well, you just need to do something. You need money. You know, so you go start a church. You expose yourself, amen, to, to certain spirits. Because you starting a church, amen, was not designed and ordained by God. They never gave you a key. They never gave you, hallelujah, the authority to that community, the authority to that city. So you go establish something. You come under the influence of the prince of the air that rules over there. So you become an extension, hallelujah, of the same problem that is going on in the community. You have no power. You have no voice. You have no authority. You have no sight. You have no governmental, governmental jurisdiction, hallelujah, to minister Christ. That even though you're talking Jesus, then they laugh, the, the powers of darkness just laugh over you <laughs> because they say, This one, <laughs> this is a church, but we own that church. We are that church, we own that church. Yes, they own the church because amen, you, you were never given the right. They say, Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Gates that defines the, the activity of men within a region must be engaged because that's the place of authority. You see, if you want to take authority over a realm, over a region, don't go, amen, and, and, and you, you know, you start praying, halalabo, shanda, da, da, da. you've got to first believe God to open your eyes to see the prince that rules over the air. You've got to, you've got to have insight. They've shown me several times the powers that rules over this nation. One of the powers that rule over this nation is the spirit of lust. Powerful spirit. That spirit has buried a lot of ministry, a lot of men of God. The spirit of perversion, lust. Strong in South Africa. So if you want to do church, you want to develop a governmental church in South Africa, and you have not conquered lust. <laughs> No matter how your government apostolic ministry is, that thing will swallow you. The Bible talk about the land that swallowed its inhabitant. That thing will swallow you. Pride is one of the spirits. Arrogant spirit. That is what leads, amen, to all the killings. If you want to, if you want to break the spirit of, of cri cri crime and criminality over South Africa, you've got to address, amen, that strong man called pride. Because it is pride that makes people think I can I can I can out wrestle a child and, and force my child over and force myself over that child and rape the child. I can out wrestle that woman and force myself. And it's, it's a pride because you see, when you are humble, you don't do such a thing it's pride it's pride pride of men 
And why, why pride? Because that pride, amen, was sourced from the things that have been done on behalf of this nation that was never really dealt with. You see, when you, when you, when you rape a nation, when you, when you rape a nation, amen, and you never really dealt with that issue of rape, like, you know, and I hate to say, well, the apartheid, but that, 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 that plays a major role. You see, all of those things that they said they did in the so-called, you know, reconciliation, those things really were just child's play, you know, were just, you know, show. This nation truly has not been restored, has not been redeemed, and has not been reconciled. It's, it's a nation of great diversity, and those diversities are good, but for now, the enemy is using that diversity to still divide the nation. But yes, said the Lord earlier, he is the one that has broken the walls of division. He wants to bring us together, but the only way and the only place we will be united is when the church in authority starts uniting via the authority that has been given to us. When we begin to unite, because it's called the power of representation. The old South Africa does not need to unite. When the church starts uniting and we begin to meet in the place called there, we begin to speak over the land, over the nation, and begin to address all these ungodly issues one by one. Listen to this. The puppet will stop functioning. You just need to deal with the puppeteer. Don't deal with the puppet. Stop running after the puppet. Stop running after the people. Stop. You see, government can only do much. <laughs> I sometimes, you know, I pity the government because what can you do? Oh, there is there's problem that you deploy police. Excuse me, a police not human being. <laughs> That's why the police also don't know what to do. They start shooting their own people. I mean, who, who goes to, to, to try to solve a problem and you start shooting people? Only people that have lost their mind do such a thing. How do you how do you bring you know how do you bring crime to a stop by shooting people? He says rubber bullet. The moment you point a gun to any human being, that person will find a way of attacking you back. That is just human science. You see, so the, the, the government will say, oh, let, let's get more God. <laughs> it's not gonna work because those things will create more. Look at the, the corona, whatever, just you know, pipe down a little level one. Do you see the number of people that have died here in Cape Town? In one weekend, 14 people died. I mean, where in the world do you find such a thing? Only in America you find you know, such a thing. The level of evil, evil in this nation. Where a father can rape our own, you know, his own daughter. A father will rape, rape. I mean, you, you ask yourself, is this real? Is this for real? Is real? So there is a spirit. It tells you that we're dealing with a spirit. I, I, I was watching the news about the man who raped, you know, the stepdaughter. Is it now hundred times? Now hundred times. How do you do such a thing? How in the world do you would know that this is not this is not ordinary? We're dealing with something that the church does not want to address. In fact, the church is not even aware that such a such a power, such a force, such a principality, amen, are over the realm. You see, the, 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 those, those demons, they don't mind you do church. They don't mind you sing. They don't mind you, hallelujah, do all those things that we do. You know, Jesus is Lord. We dance and we sing and we give our offering, you know. And all. They themselves, will, demons come to church these days in skirts and in tights. They come to church. They, they are even there on the pulpit. And when we're done, we're done. They continue the work, aluta continua. <laughs> You see, it's going to take a different breed of men. It's going to take a different breed of women. It's going to take a new order, amen, of priesthood. It's going to take, you see, it's not about how we flex our muscle. Remember, it's not about might. No, it's about our state in the spirit. It's about our condition, amen, with one another. It's about our sense of unity and agreement. Hallelujah. It's about our ability to recognize. Listen to this. How did Abraham knew that this man Melchizedek is a priest. How did Abraham identify this priest to? Those are the things that we need to be tracking. Not everybody that call themselves man of God, hallelujah, my father and the Lord. That's why I say nobody call me father and the Lord. Yes, I know, I know my children, but I don't want to be called, I don't want to be called a prophet. No, see it in my walk. Let my children know me, amen, via my assignment in their life as a father. Yeah. Uh -huh. All those cheap titles and nonsense things we're doing. It has to stop. No. No. We have to. How did, how, you see, when you see someone that carry grace, you will know. 
When you see somebody that has been with God, that God is with, you will know. Abraham was able to track Melchizedek. He, he, he went to deliver his nephew. <laughs> Coming back, the Bible says, on his way back, he met a man, a man by the name Melchizedek. And he gave him a tent of everything. You know what the tent means? He gave him the strength of his labor. He gave Melchizedek the strength. Your, your tent is your strength. Is that which you have worked for that has brought life to you and you offer it to God. That's the meaning of tight. Tent, tight. It's your strength you're giving to the Lord. <laughs> That's why certain offering that you offer to God, the priest himself must not eat it. He must burn it. <laughs> David said, I am thirsty. And some people heard and they ran, they broke through, you know, the barricade of the Philistine. They brought water to David. David said, I can't drink this. He poured it as, as an offering unto God. Hi. May God open our eyes and begin to see the ways of the spirit and see the demand of God for our day. Listen to this. A nation, a generation will remain in a particular status quo if, they, if, 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 if certain dimension of the, divine, of the desires of God, of the speakings of God over that nation, amen, has not been opened to them. So you live in that realm and you're just going to be hallelujah, praise the Lord, hallelujah, praise the Lord, until they open that order. Until they open that dimension, then you can begin to flow. Melchizedek, meaning king of righteousness. What does righteousness mean? To have a man, a proximity, a standing, an upright standing before the Lord. To have an upright standing before the Lord. This is what the Melchizedek means, amen. And also king of Salem. King of peace. So your righteousness is expressing what? The peace of God. What is the earth excuse me? What is the earth looking for today? In everything that the earth is looking for is peace. There is a prince of peace. There is a peace order in Melchizedek. But it's a priesthood. If you don't tap into that priesthood, we never walk into all of this dimension. Verse 3, and I'll, get, I'll round up. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning or Days of end of life. Resembling, listen to this. The Bible did never say it's Jesus Christ. Resembling the son, of, the son of God. Excuse me, how did they know that Melchizedek resembled the son of God? <laughs> how did they know? Amen. Because the, the resemblance of the son of God is not a feature. When God says, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. That is not a feature. That is not a skin color resembling the image of the son of God means, amen, he reflected, hallelujah, he, 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 he reflects the very life, the very value, the very intention of God. When, when, you look at, when you look at Christ, you see a resemblance in Melchizedek because Melchizedek has lived his life in such a proximity that he was able to reflect the son of God. Isn't that the life you and I are supposed to be living? That when they look at us, we ought to be reflecting, hallelujah, Christ, our God, our King. This is what Melchizedek is. Without father or mother, so, so his life is not one that can be connected to, oh yeah, he was born there. Yes, just like our Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus had a father and a mother. Amen. But the life that he lived was lived above and beyond amen, his geographical position and location. His earthly life. Amen. We need, amen. We need, listen, the reason why Melchizedek was connected to the earth, even though his order of life was of the heavenly, because a priest can only function via his opening or approval to his location. If Jesus Christ was not located in a place, then he have no voice there. A priest must be connected to a place, to a people. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Why? Because the priesthood of Melchizedek is a reflection of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. The priesthood of Melchizedek is a portal into the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. He remains a priest forever. A priest is one that represents God. So Melchizedek is not Jesus. Melchizedek is a typology, is a reflection of what we ought to become in our priesthood. 
This is a priesthood that is not located, that is not bound to the Mosaic law, that is not bound to any other priesthood. Amen. It's a priesthood of eternal life. A priesthood that stands before the Lord. Righteousness. He has a standing before the Lord. And because he has a standing before the Lord, he can usher peace into the earth. Lord, we thank you this day. What a declaration. What an opening. What a manifestation of life. What a pattern of existence. Verse 11 of that scripture, the scripture said, If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood. So they began to trace priest, a priest and the priesthood. The Levitical priesthood was good. But it was only good for a season. Because the nature, the life of the people that walked in that priesthood were compromised. Like I said, there was never anything wrong with the priesthood. Till today, the priesthood, amen, that, that God gave to, you know, to, 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 you know, to, 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 to Moses. That priesthood is still relevant. But the relevancy of that priesthood is beyond, amen, the people that operated in it. The priesthood, amen, has not changed. The priesthood is still alive. That's why everything that we're talking about, the altar of the horn, all of these are all dimension of a life that configure our position in Christ Jesus. But the people that God gave the priesthood to compromised it. The same thing that happened in the days of Elijah, all right? When, when the priesthood got compromised, the authority and the power of that priesthood could no longer function. Because all of the things, listen, all the priesthood in the scripture are all one. But showing us different dimensions and operation. That's why these are days where we must dispense all of the life of God through this priesthood. But for us to be able to do that, we need to have a clear insight, advanced revelation of the Son of God. Because when we understand the Son of God, we understand, amen, his priesthood. And when we understand his priesthood, we can function, amen, even from the dimension of the priesthood that we found, amen, in, 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 in Moses, in Aaron. All right? Because all of that priesthood reflect a nature, a, a dimension of life in Christ Jesus. Are you getting it? Because that priesthood in, 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 in Aaron, in Moses, shows us how to enter into Amen. The temple. It gives us a pattern, a way how to come into the holies of holy. All right. But that's just the beginning. That's just the first day. All right. We we don't we don't enter ministry amen, by entering the tabernacle from the outer court to the inner court to the holies of holy. No, that is our journey of salvation. We start ministry from the holies of holy to the holy place and to the outer court. Oh, come on. Our journey of salvation is journey, amen, from the outer court to the inner court. And then to the holies of holy. Ministry does not begin from the outer court. Ministry begins, amen, from the holies of holy. When we have seen the Lord, when we are seated with him, hallelujah, in that order of mercy. When we have understand and we have embraced his mercy. When we have opened the ark of the covenant and we have, we have read, hallelujah, of the written word of God. You can read that in the book of Deuteronomy 31. The Bible says, when, when Moses finished writing all of these things, the commandment, amen. He placed that command inside the ark. So when you open the ark, what you're going to find there, hallelujah, is the word of God, is the counsels of God, amen, is the law of God, is the manner. When all of this become part of our life, from there, ministry begins from the holies of holy. Your journey into ministry starts from the outer court. All right? That's why some people, when they get to the holy place and they start having revelation, suddenly they go start opening the church. They start doing ministry here and there. And they say, but, but you're, just still, you're still traveling into the place of understanding the all of God. That's why we misrepresent God. Ministry begins from the holies of holy. The journey of salvation starts from the outer courts. Lord, we thank you. Your voice is loud and clear now, Ade. Your voice is loud and clear in our day. Give us the patience to wait. Your 
you're brewing a wine in our day. Give us the patience to wait. For the wine to be fully mature so we can drink. But not only to drink for ourselves, we can present this wine to the world. Your word says you have you've kept the best for last. You've kept the best for last. Thank you for what you have kept, for what your spirit is revealing to us. These are no new things, but they are coming to us in a sense of newness. We appreciate this, oh God. Our heart rejoices. So many things you've said to us this day. Some of these things have cut us through like a sharp knife. Yes, that's what your word does. Your word is a two-edged sword. It cuts, it cuts through. We thank you. We thank you for life this day. Our life offered to you as a sacrifice, living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. I pray, Lord, that as you continue to speak to us and engage us regarding the restoration of the altar, the tabernacle, and your government, may we truly be a people that will represent your voice and desire. May the world once again see a people whose life has come to mirror this order of authority as we align to this pattern of a man, Melchizedek, king of righteousness, prince of Salem, may we walk, may we live in the high places, O oh God, of your good pleasure. We thank you, O oh God. Thank you, Father, for my brethren, every one of them. May this word sink deep into their spirit. May this word take root in the very recess of their life. May they not be afraid to embrace this word. Certain words we hear them, we, we are afraid to embrace them. It's that spirit of the fallen nature. That spirit that wants to keep us in the outer court. No, we press in, oh God. We want to have all of you that represent the ark. The ark is what we ought to represent and carry. Because it's from there that we can really represent ministry. It's called the mercy seat. In the place where, yes, the wings of the cherubims meet. He said, there I will meet with you. We thank you, O God. Honor and glory to you. Oh, hallelujah. We receive rest. Righteousness and peace. I've kissed each other. Melchizedek. Thank you. For the spirit of perfection and maturity. Through this order of a life. Oh hallelujah. In Jesus name. Amen. Once again it's a great honor. And a great privilege to share this word with you. Thank you so much everyone for joining this morning. I appreciate it. Every one of us that have connected with, with, with us this morning. I've see, I saw somebody else. You know, somebody just joined us again this morning. I really do appreciate you, my dear sister. I'm going to track your name. I've seen your face. Thank you uh, uh, for joining me. I saw that you, you sent a friend, a friend request on my Facebook timeline. It's a privilege and an honor to share this space with you. Thank you so very much. Everyone that is joining us, that is connecting with us. You want to listen to the prayer I did this morning on our YouTube channel. You can track it you can check you know connect to that on even via our facebook i think i've got a link there on facebook that you can connect to that channel or you can just go to youtube and look for potter's gate broadcast you can listen to our prayer uh, our session this morning what a time what a word we have engaged amen with the lord this morning may you continue to grow increase and mature in the voice of this brand new day god bless you have yourself a blessed and a wonderful week ahead. God bless you. Bye-bye.